you can hear me now. Um, that is going to get weird. <laughs> that is a lot of pressure to not say the wrong thing. Oh, God, it's still there. OK. So <laughs> uh, like Mary said, I'm a tech lead, and I'm uh, giving the talk. What are you now you're, you're a tech lead now? What subtitle? What is our job even? Um, so this is uh, a bit of a definition talk, but it's also really tactical. It's also um, uh, of, I want to give some stuff because there's so many people here who already do this job, right? So normally I give this talk and it's for people who are kind of new to this. They, they don't know what they're getting into or they got into it and realized for some time after they'd been doing the job that they're tech leads now <laughs> and they want to they go back and work on it. But um, I know a lot of the people in this room already do this job. So we'll talk about some tactical stuff because I want you to be able to take home some things to be able to work on in your own teams. So I'm Aaron. I'm a PHP developer, which means I'm a big nerd. I'm a technical lead, which means I like to tell other nerds what to do. Um, and I'm an independent. So I used to work in an agency, and that's pretty important for this talk because I'm going to use the language of that world. So I'm going to talk about clients. I'm going to talk about hours and budgets. You might not have those at your job. If you don't have those, that is fine because you have something similar. So when I say client, if you don't have actual paying clients, here stakeholders, here management, here users, here whichever one is appropriate for whatever you're doing. Um, when I say hours or budget, just think of that as the general sense of you have to do this in some sort of timeline or you're going to lose your job. So it might not be as official or as specific as what I'm doing, but this stuff all connects. So you, like I said, you maybe have recently become a tech lead. You aren't a tech lead yet, but you th think you might want to be. And if that's you and you paid to come to this conference, um, spoiler alert, you, you're, you're among your people because that's really nerdy and I love you for it. <laughs> or you are already a tech lead and you want to improve. So that's, that's probably most of us in this room are either already using, doing that job or doing something very adjacent to it. But there's a lot of ambiguity around this term, tech leading. Not everybody even uses it, right? So um, let's settle this and fix that and know where we're going next. A tech lead is the owner of the technological vision for a project and the technical leader of the project team. So I really like the first half of this, the owner of the technological vision, because that's what differentiates what we do from project management or product ownership or just being a senior engineer. So a product owner, they may advocate for the user, they may advocate for the, uh, the business needs or the use cases, but they're not going to worry about how do we get it done. Project manager is making sure that we get it done. They care very much about the brass tacks of the scheduling, the brass tacks of who's talking to the client, perhaps. Some places you'll talk to the client or to the user, some places not. Oh. Hey. <laughs> you saw nothing. Um, <coughs> or uh, a senior dev, you know, but a project manager is not going to worry about the technical details. They're going to trust that the team can do that part because they're not technical experts. And a senior dev is worried about those technical things, but they're not necessarily seeing the whole project. They're really focused on perhaps a very difficult problem, but it's still a contained domain in which they are the masters of the details. This looks a little different everywhere you go. Not everyone even uses this term. And places that it's used, use it slightly differently. So. Um, in some cases, it's a job title. In a lot of places, it's more of a project role. So maybe you're the tech lead on this project, but you're just a person on this other one. Um, maybe it's more of a continual management or leadership position that you have. Every place is going to have a different set of de expectations, a different set of deliverables. And there's the specific stuff that we're told about. It's in your job description. Maybe you write requirements. 
Maybe you do senior level architecture and you decide how we're gonna write this. You make technology decisions on the stack. You uh, have to write require, oh I said write requirements. You have to make sure those requirements are implemented throughout the course of the project. But then there's the things that you're not necessarily told about. The intangibles of this job. Saying no to scope creep. Settling disputes between two developers who wanna do things diametrically opposed ways. That's the stuff that they don't tell you about up front, but that makes or breaks the job that you're doing. It can be hard to reconcile all of these different things that we have to do and all of these different organizations that we might do it in and all these different ways that we get it done in one talk with one set of ideas and definitions and tactics. But here's the thing. The bottom line is that at the end of the day, it's about making good software with a team. And the one thing that is consistent on every software team that you will ever work on, literally ever, no exceptions, is that there are people on that team. And people are pretty, we're similar in a lot more ways than we are different. Which means we're hackable, which is good because we like that. So we can talk about the psychology of humans, we can talk about the psychology of groups. Camille talked about a lot of that in her talk this morning. There are things that you can do that regardless of your stack, regardless of your, whether you're agile or waterfall or whatever you are, you can apply these tactics. So I'm gonna distill this down. We're gonna achieve tech lead mastery in three easy steps. Facilitate, help your team do their job. Advocate. Keep the big picture in mind the whole time. And motivate. Guide your team to the best possible result. We're gonna get into the details of each of these. But this is, this is our basic rallying cry. This is our thesis. These are the things that regardless of your technological situation, this is what you have to do to be successful. So, facilitate. Your job is to help other people do their jobs which can be really unsatisfying sometimes because there aren't necessarily like obvious metrics. You aren't necessarily looking at your own lines of code that are written. You're not necessarily worrying about how many tickets did you close. You're doing something more intangible a lot of the time. You're helping other people get their work done. Always be asking yourself, what's next? What is my team gonna need next from me? So if there's a roadblock, you move it. If somebody can't get their work done, that's, that's where you come in. You jump up and you say, I'll talk to the admin, I'll get those requirements, I'll figure out what's up with the UX, it looks weird too, I totally agree. You're gonna be the one that is, that is working that out. But that's firefighting if you only wait until somebody is blocked. What you wanna do is look ahead and perceive the need. This is um, a Minnesota phrase that I've learned. I live in Minneapolis now, but I'm from Chicago, which might, means that I've been able to approach uh, the culture there from sort of a south side Irish, very profane, um, anthropological point of view. <laughs> and one thing that I've learned about Minnesotans is that they uh, really pride knowing what you need or are going to need before you have to ask for it. Asking for something is frankly sort of rude. So to help someone not be rude, you assume, or you, uh, you try, not assume, but you try very hard to anticipate what their needs are. So. True story, I was at my brother-in-law's house and he gave me some pretzels and I'm eating them and they're delicious and they're salty. So I turn around to ask for a glass of water and he is standing there <laughs> with a glass of water and I was like, that's funny, I was just gonna ask you for that. And he's like, of course, pretzels are salty. <laughs> and I was really weirded out, but then I married in, so whatever, I guess it wasn't that bad. But you wanna, you wanna cultivate that same sense of helpfulness. You want to see what's gonna happen before it does. So if your dev is gonna need access to a client's FTP server on Friday, don't wait for them to ask you. Just ping the admin Tuesday. Look ahead. Get it figured out. It's a great sin to leave somebody blocked. So the only way that you can make sure that you don't sin is to look ahead. Otherwise, you're going to be constantly behind the eight ball. Oh, yeah, let's do it. So, tactic number one to make this happen, 
use tickets, use hours, and use burn downs. And the PMs in the room just got like really excited. <laughs> um, but seriously, I love, I love estimates and I love burn downs. And that is because data helps us make decisions. And data helps us have arguments and helps us have productive ones. Because if you just have a general gut feeling that something is or isn't gonna work, that's one thing. But if you can sit down and look at your burn down and see the number of hours that you have that are, you know, you need to launch this thing in June and you're not gonna get it done till August, that is not something that someone can get offended by. That's not something that someone can push back on and say, eh, can't you just try harder? It's like, no, these are facts. What are we gonna do with them? So data makes things less personal, and it makes us more able to have productive decisions and move on to the next, the next thing that we need to do to get the project moving. Your job now, though, is to be interrupted. That's just reality. So what you have to do is figure out when is it appropriate to help somebody and do the thing for them, and when is it appropriate to make them do it themselves? And it's really frustrating to get interrupted because the startup time is a very real thing. You lose your train of thought, you have to switch tasks, but in the overall ecosystem of the organization, it takes them 10 minutes to ask you, takes you 10 minutes to answer them, takes you another 10 minutes to get back to what you're doing, that's 30 minutes. If it would have taken them two hours to solve it on their own, that's overall efficiency. Your job is to be interrupted now, sorry but it's for the health of the team and it's for the health of the project. So you need to know all the answers or at least where to find them because you're gonna get interrupted a lot. You're gonna have people coming to you all the time because you're supposed to be the, the resource on the project, right? So you're gonna have PMs and management and clients who wanna know what the state of things are and QA and the uh, customer support who wants to know why this and this and this is always broken you're gonna get interrupted all the time. And that is only gonna get worse the longer you work somewhere because you accumulate more knowledge and more people have worked with you and decided that you're super smart and they wanna ask you about whatever. It's a problem that only gets worse. So you just have to accept that that's part of this. So know everything or at least know where to point people. Teach them how to fish, that is fine. You always wanna be evaluating any request to say, is this something that I should do now, in 10 minutes, this afternoon, next week, according to your priorities and the priorities of the organization. This is a, a fantastic quote from a man who will be very upset if I call him my mentor. He made that really clear. Um, it's fine to admit not knowing something, but never as an excuse. I don't know should burst joyfully from your lips, followed by, but I will find out. So you can ask for advice, that's okay. In fact, it's recommended. You should really ask for advice. But when your job is now the person who gets interrupted, when your job is to have the vision of the project, you don't get to say, not my job. You're now responsible for making sure that that answer gets to where, it, or that question gets to where it needs to be, or that that person who asks you the question gets their answer. What's cool about this though is we can use it as a learning opportunity. For example, I, at the agency I was at, was doing a lot of work with DNS, but sort of sporadically, because every project I had to advise clients on, how are we gonna set this up, and who's hosting your DNS, and who's hosting the site, and you know, what are we gonna do? And so I had to be able to speak intelligently about it, but also, I wasn't necessarily the one implementing it, so I was going to the admins a lot, and just being like, can you make me sound smart? Because I'm, I kinda know, but I don't know the words to use exactly, I'm gonna talk to their, you know, their admin and sound really dumb if you don't tell me exactly how to say this stuff. I could always have gone back and asked them for that help, but I use it as an opportunity to learn more about that thing. So instead of just saying what was the answer, I said, what was the answer, explain it to me, please. And then I was able to use that information and get smarter, and then more people asked me more things, and then that just kept getting worse. But that's okay, because that's job security. So <laughs> use these opportunities to learn lots of stuff. So second, to get things done right, you need to advocate. Your job is to advocate for whoever is not in the room. If you're talking to your devs and they wanna cut corners, you need to advocate 
for the client, for the users, for the people who are gonna use this software, for the people who are gonna maintain it afterwards. But if you're talking to management, and they wanna push back on a timeline, they say that that has to happen faster, we can't do this, there's not enough time, can't you just make it, you know, can't you stop writing tests, can't you, uh, lots of terrible things. Now you're advocating for the devs. Now you're in that room saying, no, we can't, and here is why. And no matter who you're talking to, you're advocating. If you're talking to, if you are in an agency sitting, or something where you're getting requests, so maybe it's all internal stakeholders, maybe it's that manager that is always saying, I have an idea, write it, I don't care if it's hard or, or technically possible. You need to advocate for the project. Push back on that. Sometimes you have to say no. So you need to have the 10,000 foot view in your head so that you can make good decisions about what to do on the ground. Because when you're always advocating for everybody, the only way to be successful in those moments, those split second decisions, is to know what's going on, but more importantly, why. Because you want to trust your developers to make good decisions about how to implement stuff, right? I mean, they're smart, that's why they work there. They're probably smart, they're smart, okay? Um, and you want to trust them and let them fill in what's gonna happen. So in that case, you need to know the why. So when they say, well, what if we, you can say, that's a really good idea, or no, and here's why. Because developers, most humans, but especially developers who are a little ornery and a little logical, work a lot better if you give them a why. <coughs> Just saying yes or no doesn't work. And you all know that, because you're also people. And you're smart people, and you're people who like to build. So if we give people the context, they can use that context to make better decisions. However, you're only human, so you can't actually know everything. So write everything down, everything. Send meeting recaps, send emails that recap conversations that happened in the hallway, especially send recaps of any conversation you have with a stakeholder, somebody who can make your life harder. This is how we avoid Groundhog's Day meeting syndrome, <laughs> which is where you go into a meeting and you spend an hour and a half digging into something and figuring out the details and it is agonizing and everybody has very strong opinions and by the end of it, no one has strong opinions because you're all defeated, but you have come to something that you agree works and next week you have that meeting again. <laughs> this is how we cut that off. It's especially effective with the kind of clients who like to change their minds or the kinds of managers who like to decree how to do things. Because if you can show somebody not only what you agreed on, but why, they can't push back against that. Or they can, but they need to have reasons. They can't just change with the wind. So this stuff can really save your bacon, both in terms of like financially, if that's what, if you're really talking in terms of hours and money and things like that on a, on a client project, and just insanity, because nobody can stand those meetings. So here's how to advocate when you're talking to certain people. Talking to developers. developers love, love to do things right. There are degrees of correctness to everything though. So if the developer wants to write the most perfect, reusable, whatever, whatever, but it's not gonna actually get reused, that's not efficient. Everybody likes to write reusable code and no one wants to reuse anybody else's code. <laughs> So if they're gonna over-engineer something that literally no one else is gonna use, that's not saving anything. So push back in those moments. Have a sense of scope. Don't be scared to say no. In fact, I got kind of a reputation for always being like, no, that's out of scope, no, that's out of scope. And one day, one of my team members came up to me and he was like, okay, so I have this idea. I was thinking that if we did this and this and this, then we could get this other feature later and it's a much more structured, thing, and, and no, we're not gonna use it right away, but I really like it, but then I realized you'd say no, so I just didn't even ask you, and he walked away. <laughs> I was so proud. <laughs> like, that was a good moment, guys. So, um, push back, it's okay. Um, when you're talking to management, use those burn downs, those tickets, and those hours that you have set up. When they want something faster, give them hard facts. Don't say no. 
say, no, but. No, we can't do that. But if you gave us another week, we'd have time. Or, no, we can't do that. But if you bought a subscription to this particular product, then we could at least see. No, we can't do that, but give me a week for exploratory. Because what's gonna happen is that person's gonna either decide, yeah, that's important, or, oh, I, no, I guess not. Because I don't wanna pay for it. So when you give an answer back that they can't argue with, they can't argue with you. So make sure you walk into those things with that data. Make it impersonal. Bring in facts, push back, be firm. But you also have to be reasonable because again, we are all developers and we all always wanna do it right. And there are trade-offs. Any software has trade-offs. So don't push back on everything management wants just because management wants it. If you do that, you're gonna get a reputation as somebody who's hard to work with, who can never be trusted to make the right decisions, the right trade-offs. And of course you can, that's why you're in that position. So don't forget that stuff. With clients, again, you need to be able to say no to people. Whether it's clients, stakeholders, users, whatever it is, you need to know when no that's not happening is the right thing to say. Just say no to feature creep. That is advocating for the project. One way to make sure this doesn't happen is to always be going back to the requirements. You have requirements, right? You have, you have user stories or requirements or you know what you're building, right? <laughs> okay. If not, that's another talk that I would be happy to give. Um, but make sure that you're not adding too much, you know? So always be going back, always be saying no, no, no. Always be comparing ABC to the requirements. Coffee is for shippers and you'll never ship if you keep letting all the features get added. Finally, to get things done, you need to motivate your team. So tech leads, we have a little bit of telling people what to do power, but generally speaking, we're not actually managerial. I mean, some of you are in this room, so that's, that's more true right now than a lot of times when I give this talk, but not all of us are. And yet, we still have to get people to do things. That sounds like a problem, but it's actually a really good thing because it means that you can't fall back on being a dictator, fall back on hierarchy. You have to actually motivate people. It's not as hard as it sounds. Um, but I don't wanna scare you, but like, tech leading is a form of management. So if you thought that you were avoiding that whole thing by getting into this, you're wrong. Sorry. But it's the good kind. It's the best kind of management. It is empowering people through leadership to do their best work. And that is awesome. And that is what every manager should be. The first key to this is your attitude. You're gonna set the tone for the project. You're gonna set the tone for the team. So if you're negative all the time, your team's gonna be negative. If you're not confident, your team's not confident. Whatever you are is the ceiling. Your team can't be more optimistic, more confident, more calm, more whatever it is than you are. So you need to figure out how to be the wall that all of the project crazy runs into and then just splashes off and keeps your developers behind you safe and dry. Absorb the crazy. Let everybody else feel calm and confident. Another big part of this is you're, you can't, um, you gotta watch the negativity. So like, we all need to blow off steam sometimes. But if you create a culture of blowing off steam, then you're in trouble because that becomes toxic. That becomes something where it's us versus them. Where whoever it is you're always blowing off the steam about, we're never working with them. And again, this is, this is basic human psychology, this is tribalism. Don't encourage it. We all need to let it go sometimes, but be really deliberate. Do it behind closed doors with a very deliberate audience, and don't dwell on it. Get it off your chest, but then move on, because when we're complaining, we're not finding solutions. So it feels good, but it's not productive. One of my favorite ways to motivate people, though, is passive aggressive whiteboarding. <laughs> so here's the thing. Lots of research has shown that external motivators, like higher salaries, more PTO, free beer, free cake, doesn't actually motivate people to do better work. It has a very, very short and fleeting returns. The best motivator is intrinsic motivation. It's when people motivate themselves and want to do something. 
So passive aggressive whiteboarding is a way to trick people into motivating themselves. I had a, here's an example. I had a project where there was kind of a big project. There were three developers, another front end developer. So three back end, one front end, and me. And we had a lot of work to do. And w our schedule was pretty tight. And I was getting really nervous. And one of the developers was definitely not taking this one particular part of it seriously enough. By the way, I sign NDAs, so all of my stories are like someone did a thing and then someone else did a thing. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so the developer was just not taking this one feature seriously enough. And I kept being like, hey, I'm a little nervous. And he'd be like, no, it's fine. I'll get to it, whatever. And I'm like, I'm still nervous. And he's like, no, it's cool. Um, and that, like, wh that's it. Like, what do you do with that? You're at an impasse. So what I did was I said, hey, can you show me how you want to write that? And he was like, oh, yeah, sure. So I went to a room, and he started whiteboarding it. And I was like, well, what about? And he's like, yep, nope, got that covered. Going to do that here. And I was like, OK, but what about? And he's like, nope. And then I said, but what about? And that was like the light bulb moment where I saw just both the realization and like the dread that just <laughs> washed over his face. And he was like, oh. And I was like, yeah, I've been saying that for weeks, <laughs> but cool. Because getting somebody to walk through that process, he realized it in his own heart of hearts, in his own brain. He logically had gotten to that place where he couldn't deny it. And me just telling him, he could always just come back and say, no, I don't think that's true. So passive aggressive whiteboarding is a fantastic way to trick people into figuring out what you already know, <laughs> but they haven't settled on yet. Here's the thing about being any kind of technical leader. You're not right in the code, but it's your responsibility, which is kind of miserable. I'm really selling this job, aren't I? <laughs> That's a rough place to be in, because you don't have much telling people what to do power. But you're going to be in trouble if they don't do what you need to tell them to do. So motivation is a big part of this. Getting people you know, motivated properly to do a really good job and make everybody work together, that helps so much. So does the advocating. So, do, so you're, you're putting boundaries on the project. So you're setting yourselves up for success. You're, you're creating a situation where you can actually succeed. But another really important part of this is mitigating risk. As a tech lead, as that senior developer, as that senior engineer, as that lead developer, you are going to be looking for the last 10%. So developers are really good about getting to 90%, and then there's just that last 10%, which is actually 50% of the project. But they don't see it, because they're exhausted, because they're unhappy, <laughs> because it took them this long to get here, and dang it, they are done. So to mitigate risk in those situations, to find those 10% gaps, Ask people to show you their work. This is another form of passive aggressive whiteboarding. But say, hey, cool, you finished it, can you demo it for me? Because when they load it up and we find out that they didn't commit a file or they just didn't finish the front end because they were so excited about getting the back end working, that stuff just becomes obvious. And they'll see it and go, all right, my bad, let me go finish it. So that's a really good way to mitigate risk. The best way is to go after the parts of the project that scare you the most and relentlessly chase down answers until you aren't scared. So when we look at a project, we look at some software we have to write. Our tendency is to do the thing we already know how to do. You want the easy win. You just want to dive in. And there's some other part that you're not quite sure how it works yet, but you'll get there. It's some other third-party integration you have to work with. It's the new hotness JavaScript stack that your front-end developer has convinced you that you have to use, but you don't know anything about. It's um, a lot of different things, and it's that black box. When you sit down and look at a project, be honest with yourself about where that black box is and charge headfirst into it. The less that you want to do part of the project, the more you probably need to start there. So focus on those things and just tear them down until they're not black boxes at all until you know what you're looking at and what you're working with. Because those are the places where you have your unknown unknowns. You may think it's a known unknown, because you say, yeah, it's, it's that thing. I haven't figured it out yet, but I know I have to figure it out. That's a known unknown. The unknown unknown is 
everything that you didn't figure out yet. So dive into those things and uh, focus on being the catalyst that makes sure that everybody has thought about all of the different parts and the way they come together and aren't just going, eh, it'll take care of itself. Last note, I wanna be straight up. It can be hard to code when you're a tech lead. Once you're doing some kind of leadership, it is tricky. Because coders work on the maker schedule, which is you need long chunks of time. But tech leads, you shift to a manager schedule. You're interruptible. Your job is to be interrupted. Your job is to help other people get their stuff done. So the reality is that sometimes you don't get to program as much anymore. And there are ways to figure out how to fit it in there, but you're never gonna code as much as you used to. And you need to accept it, and your management needs to accept it. And if it isn't accepted, push back on it until it is. And if, and if this breaks your heart, maybe this isn't the thing for you. I mean, not this conference, this conference is great, but leading the team in this way, maybe that's not your thing and that's okay. Just like, no, be realistic about it. But to end on a downer note, there's still lots of things that you can do to try to, to mitigate this, to try to pull it back together, to figure out how can you be effective for your team and also not go crazy at the same time. So advocate, facilitate, motivate, and kick butt. Thank you.